So I'll briefly mention the types of peaks that you can see from chip-seek assays. And so in terms of, uh, you know, calling peaks for histone modifications, uh, as well as transcription factors and other protein or other DNA binding proteins, uh, what's interesting to note is that the, uh, the peaks, the characteristics of the peaks that you get in your ChIP-seq assays depends on the histone marker, the transcription factor that you're looking at in particular. And so, for example, for um, if you're looking at peaks of transcription factors, uh, transcription factors tend to have very sharp and narrow peaks. And so when you're kind of just scanning the uh, ChIP-seq signal for transcription factors that are uh, generally specific, uh, you'll tend to be able to identify peaks very well because they're they're super sharp and obvious. Um, on the other hand, certain types of marks like K36 trimethylation uh, tend to tend to be broader than your narrow peaks. And so you can see in this diagram here that compared to the transcription factors, um, the peaks are are much wider and have some uh, oscillation and periodicity to them. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum for certain like heterochromatin marks, uh, your peaks can actually be very wide. And so they can be on the order of like kilobases long. Um, so your peaks for a K27 trimethylation, for example, um, would be much wider than K36 trimethylation. And so the main point here is that uh, when you do peak calling, you need to make sure that the software that you're using uh, is calibrated for the right kind of peak. Like you wouldn't want to, um, you wouldn't want to use a peak caller and tell it that it should expect very broad peaks when you're looking at uh, transcription factor chip seek data, or vice versa. So you need to make sure that the uh, peak caller is expecting the right type of peaks in the data, uh, because uh, these peak callers basically need to know what the general shape of the peaks it should be expecting looks like. Uh, otherwise, it, it can really screw up in terms of calling uh, false positives or false negatives. So it's worth discussing for a few moments why there can be both narrow and broad peaks arising from ChIP-seq assays. And so if you consider ChIP-seq assays for highly specific DNA binding transcription factors, Basically, what happens there is that after the cross-linking and fragmentation step of the ChIP-seq assay, generally speaking, there's the, the fragmentation will occur pretty close to the binding site on either side of the TF. And so what's going to happen is that your forward and reverse strands are going to align pretty close to the binding site of interest. And so... Uh, after you do your strand cross correlation, you're going to end up with a pretty sharp peak where the TF binding site is. On the other hand, if you consider uh, running a ChIP-seq assay on, say, a repressive epigenetic mark, generally speaking, repressive epigenetic marks happen uh, in regions that are also uh, dense in nucleosomes uh, positioned around that region. And so because during the fragmentation step, Fragmentation tends to, depending on how you do it, it tends to happen to, you know, more accessible regions of the genome. That means that fragmentation is going to happen less often between nucleosomes. So if you have a region like the one shown here on the right, where you have, say, three packed nucleosomes, the uh, fragmentation is going to happen more frequently outside of the packed region than inside, although you're still going to get some fragmentation happening between the nucleosomes. And so what ends up happening is that your forward and reverse uh, reads are going to be distributed uh, more broadly across that region that is repressed. And so that's how you end up with, with broader peaks. And another related reason why broad peaks can happen is that, again, uh, you have to consider that nucleosomes uh, can be dynamic in their nature. So they can uh, basically come and go from different regions of the genome. And so for regions where there's... Uh, higher variation in occupancy, you could imagine that because the chip seek assay typically pools genomic material from across many cells, then if you have a region that, uh, you know, sometimes has nucleosomes there and sometimes doesn't, then, uh, you know, you can, you can end up with uh, 
uh, forward and reverse strands coming from certain regions of the genome. Um, when there doesn't happen to be uh, any, any nucleosomes in that position, but sometimes when nucleosomes are there, then they're occluded. And so uh, basically the point I'm making is that the distribution of reads over the genome can also depend on, on other things like um, how much variation in, in nucleosome occupancy there is. And so I spoke previously uh, when we were looking at the MAX2 output about uh, this concept of fold enrichment or fold change. And so here I just kind of want to visualize what exactly that looks like. Um, and so here again uh, on top, I'm showing you an example of um, basically the signal that you might see from your chipseq assay versus your control. And so basically your fold enrichment is essentially the relative heights of your peaks in your chipseq assay versus your control. And so what's important to note is that, uh, like we talked about uh, previously, there's a difference between fold enrichment and statistical significance in the sense that if you look at the peaks on the le on the far left and far right, uh, in both cases, your relative enrichment ratio of your chipseq assay to control is 1.5. On the left, you basically have uh, essentially a signal of 15 in your in your assay versus 10 in your control. And on the right, you have a relative signal of 150 versus in your experiment versus 100 in your control. And so in both cases, the relative heights of the peaks is basically 1.5. And so the fold enrichment is the same, but the p-value will be much smaller for the peak on the right because there's more reads mapping to, the, to those two locations. And that's why the numbers are bigger. And so generally speaking, the more reads that map to both your uh, chipseq assay and your control, um, the more statistical significance you can get. Because if you see an enrichment of 50%, like you do on the far right, when you have lots of reads mapping there, basically your certainty about that estimate 1.5 is much higher than in the left, where you might only have, say, for example, 15 reads mapping in your chipseq assay versus 10 in your control you might say, okay, well, yeah, the enrichment ratio is 1.5, but maybe you just happen to get an extra five reads mapping there in your chipseq assay just by chance. Um, and so your p-value essentially reflects that. Um, and so uh, basically the rest of this slide is, is uh, the point of this slide is basically just to tell you that your p-value calculation depends on essentially the number of reads mapping to those locations in both your chipseq assay and your control. And the more reads that map there, uh, the smaller your p-value can get. And so I mentioned earlier that uh, looking at the so-called nominal p-value, so the unchanged p-value is typically a bad idea when you're looking at lots of peaks. And so your most, you know, the, the first thing you should ask yourself is you should say, well, you know, maybe I should just do some uh, p-value correction via these Bonfroni or FDR-based methods that uh, we just learned about. And so one of the problems of using uh, both kind of FDR and Bonfroni based p-value corrections is that because those p-values depend on the number of reads mapping to a given location, that means that essentially your p-values that you get are a function of, for example, your input sequencing depth or the input DNA material that you had in the first place. And so because when you're comparing chipseq assays across experiments, you don't always have good control over the sequencing depth or the amount of input material you have. That means that you can get systematically different p-values between two different experiments due to reasons other than you know, actual biology. Um, similarly, if you're comparing chipseq peaks across different histone modifications, because, certain, because not all antibodies are of equal quality, um, some, certain uh, histone modifications might get better p-values just because the antibody was better. Um, similarly, uh, another problem is that FDR corrected uh, key values can actually be quite unstable in the sense that when you look at when you actually look at uh, key values that come out of Max two, um, you'll notice that a ton of peaks are have key values very close to zero point zero five, and so you know one of the problems of using uh, p values and key values and so on is that sometimes the choice of threshold, in this case 0 0.05, is very arbitrary. And so ideally, you would hope that your results are uh, robust to the specific choice of uh, p-value or q-value threshold. So 
you would hope that if you change your threshold from 0.05 to say 0.06, that most of your peaks uh, would would be the same. But actually, it turns out that for a lot of ship seek assays for histone marks, um, lot because lots of the peaks have Q value close to 0.05, um, you'll you'll actually see that the set of peaks that you get vary a lot, even if you change this threshold just by a little bit. Um, and again, also uh, because different peak colors differ based on how they consider reads mapping to the same location and things like this. Um, it's hard to compare Q values and P values across different P colors um, just because uh, there may be different biases in the statistical test that each of these uh, P colors use. And so why this is a problem is that oftentimes, just like every other assay that you, you would typically do, um, it's pretty common to do replicate experiments. Uh, and obviously the idea sounds good. Um, if you do replicate chip seek experiments, uh, you would, you know, for the peaks that you care about, you would hope that they replicate well across the different replicates. But again, uh, because of all the problems we talked about on the previous slide, um, replicates can actually show differences even in terms of like peak height. Um, and in practice, a lot of the peaks that are shorter um, and that are kind of closer to the threshold of Q of 0 0.05, a lot of those actually don't replicate very well. And so, you know, a couple of the solutions people thought of is they're like, well, okay, if I do two replicates, um, what if I just, uh, what if for my downstream analysis, I just consider uh, a region of the genome to have a peak if either of the replicates had a peak in that region? So that's what's called a union operation. And so that tends to lead to too many false positive uh, peaks because it's essentially you're keeping the peaks from both replicates. And so you're, you're keeping all the false positives from everybody. Um, another potential solution is to take what's called the intersection. So that means that you only keep a peak if it actually is called as a peak in both replicates. And so this tends to be too stringent in the sense that you get too many false negatives. So you throw away too many real peaks um, because the bar is too high. Um, and so one of the solutions people came up with is what's known, what's called the irreproducible discovery rate. Um, and so we'll discuss that on the next slide. And so the idea of the irreproducible discovery rate is that um, if you rank the set of all peaks from a given replicate by either say the p-value or the fold enrichment, you would hope that the top peaks whether that's by p-value or full enrichment, are common across the two replicates. And so uh, the idea of the irreproducible discovery rate is that you, you rank peaks across your two replicates, and then you start going down the ranked list in, across your two replicates. And what you'll tend to notice is that uh, the rank, basically the top ranked peaks tend to agree very well between replicates. And, but as you go further down the rank list to the weaker and weaker peaks, they tend to their ranks tend to be more and more discordant between your two replicates. And so the idea of the IDR uh, test is that you basically only want to keep peaks whose rank is consistent across your replicates. And so an IDR threshold of 10%, for example, would mean that 10% of the peaks uh, that you call using IDR are not reproducible across the two replicates. And so this is, um, you know, in contrast to FDR, where an FDR of 10% or 0 0.1 means 10% of your peaks are false positives. And so one of the benefits of using IDR to select peaks is that using IDR tends to lead to more consistent behavior uh, between different peak colors. And so, for example, if you took a set of chipsy assays that you've done and you've uh, taking the raw reads and you call peaks using either, for example, like the max or the SPP uh, peak colors, what you'll notice is that if you only keep peaks that meet an IDR threshold of 1%, then you'll actually see pretty decent agreement between max and SPP despite being different peak colors. And so the graph on the left represents uh, the number of peaks called by either max or on the x-axis, the number of peaks called by SPP, uh, called on a number of different 
chip-seq assays, and you can see that basically the points lie pretty close to the y equals x line, which indicates that the number of pieces called by either max or SPP agrees with each other on these different uh, assays. Whereas on the right hand side, you can see that if you just keep uh, peaks that meet an FDR threshold of 1% uh, according to either color, then across the same set of assays, you can see that the number of peaks called by either max or SPP diverges quite a bit from the y equals x line uh, across the same set of assays. And so the point here is that selecting peaks using the IDR thresholds uh, basically leads to more consistent behavior and a more consistent set of peaks uh, across different peak colors than if you just use FDR.